The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. This is episode number 185. When a person is addicted to drugs or alcohol, the myriad of choices of treatment can be overwhelming. Narconon Ojai is a residential treatment facility that addresses the physical, mental, and spiritual aspects of addiction. With a proven, evidence-based, step-by-step program designed to free those trapped by addiction. For more information, call 866-231-5924. Today we have an interview with a lady that we spoke to way back in 2017 when we started this podcast. Her name is Joanne Peterson. Joanne Peterson is the founder and executive director of Learn to Cope, a nonprofit peer-led support network established in 2004. Ms. Peterson's journey started when she was a young girl as her siblings experienced issues with mental illness and addiction. Funded by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, Learn to Cope has grown to have a full staff who collaborate with communities across the state, spreading messages of prevention, education, awareness, and advocacy. Moreover, Learn to Cope has 25 chapters throughout Massachusetts, a chapter in Florida, and a private online forum that supports over 11,000 members. Currently, Ms. Peterson sits on the Massachusetts Health and Human Services Emergency Department Working Group, along with the Governor's Special Commission to investigate and study licensed addiction treatment centers for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. She is a board member of RIZE Massachusetts, a member of the Attorney General's Interagency Task Force on Newborns with Neonatal Abstinence Syndrome, and a part of the Family Advisory Council for the Purdue Pharma Lawsuits. Yay, Joanne. She serves on the advisory boards of the National Child and Traumatic Stress Network, as well as Harvard University's Recovery Research Institute. Let's talk to Joanne Peterson from Learn to Cope. So Joanne Peterson from Learn to Cope, thank you so much for being willing to be on the podcast today and again and telling your story again. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for having me. It's it's an, an honor. Thank you. So I want to do it a little bit differently than when we spoke to you the last time. And tell me, like, how did you get started on this whole road of addiction? And, and I know you yourself were not an addict, but you have familial m- members who who were addicts. How did that all start for you? How did you get become aware of this problem? Well, probably around the age of 10, um, I was a sibling first. I had a brother and a sister that battled um, my brother mainly um, addiction, and my sister had severe mental illness, schizophrenia. Um, He ended up with a cocaine addiction, and at a very young age, he was in trouble a lot, in and out of jail, incarcerated. So, um, you know, I watched my mom kind of suffer alone trying to deal with all of that between both of them um and the signs and symptoms of what my sister had were very similar to the signs and symptoms of someone actively using um but was she medicated joanne no she was not and it was back Mm -hmm. in the 70s before they even really did anything about they didn't even use the words mental health they just said you know she's probably um manic depressive or or crazy, they would just say, people would just call her, she's crazy, you know, she drinks too much. She would medicate herself with alcohol. Mm. Um, And that's what we thought was that she just drank too much. We didn't, back in those days, you didn't really talk about treatment or the word addiction or anything like that. It was more like she drinks too much and he's in trouble all the time. And, and you know, my mom was um, somebody that didn't really ask for help. because back in those days, you really weren't supposed to. Um, you were supposed to keep everything in the home, not talk about it. Um, and she was an excellent mother. Like, she was the most loving mother. But, you know, she she 
reached out, went to a meeting, and, and what they told her was just kick them out. There's nothing you can do. Just kick them out. Nothing you can do. You know, just take care of yourself. And and that's the message she had. And, and you know, even though she was a loving mother to them, she did, you know, do that. And at some point she had to as well because it got really out of hand. But um, I guess I learned at a really young age um, one thing I, I really learned years later, I think looking back was I always looked up to my brother. He was like a hero to me. So I could mm -hmm. never understand, you know, why other people didn't after a while or, um, you know, I knew he was just a really good person with a really bad problem. <laughs> my sister, on the other hand, was really hard because her disease, um, really ravaged her mind by the time she was about 20 and that's when you know we started realizing this was a lot more than than alcohol the alcohol she was medicating herself with i can look back at that now and see that but um it was the the schizophrenia that ravaged her mind and today she's in a nursing home at you know 59 years old and completely delusional with you know paranoid schizophrenia so and I learned later in life that that's when it usually comes on in early 20s. Um, mm -hmm. And again, back then, there wasn't really any information about anything or how to help people with, with anything. It was more like you had to just take care of yourself. There was no meetings out there to help you find treatment for people or anything like that. back in the And you didn't talk about it. You weren't supposed to talk about it. It's something that you were just supposed to, yeah, keep hidden. No, so you just live with the shame and, you know, you know, it's like wearing a heavy blanket, you know, there'd be like an article in the newspaper. So everyone knew things were going on, but you weren't, you didn't talk about it. So then you were like kind of, you know, the different people in town, you know, it was, you know, it was a, a lot of shame, I think, um, not understanding what was actually wrong, that he really, what he needed was help. And then by the time he ended up incarcerated all the time, you know, it was it was sad because he really would have loved to have had a normal life. He was a good hearted person and he just couldn't get out of that hole. And then incarceration, after years of it, I think he felt more comfortable there than he did on the outside. And he ended up, you know, kind of institutionalized, just in and out of jail for very petty things. Never, you know, murder or, you know, a big major major deal but he did probably did more time than some people that have murdered somebody and wow. then he, had, he passed away in 2011 so okay that was very sad how old was he when he passed away he was 52 okay yeah. what was it like as a young child i mean did you did you get a, a I'm sorry. Did you lose out on a lot of attention because of what your mother had to deal with, with your brother and sister? I think so. Um, and, and that's, that's common today too, in, in a family. And I think it was more that what happens is you get worn out. So my mother was probably pretty worn out. <laughs> she was a single parent as well, you know, mm -hmm. trying to provide. Um, and you know, the shame and the stigma that was out there back then um, might be even a little worse than it is today. Um, and, you know, she she was ashamed to, um, you know, when things would be in the newspaper. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a heavy burden for a parent to carry. And then, you know, to also have another child that's very young, and have to bring her to visit her brother in jail on Sundays. So, <laughs> you know, you said you talked about shame a couple times, and the other thing I think um, exists, and I know you know this from your organization, and we're definitely going to talk a, a lot about your organization, and that's guilt, because so often, even if the parent doesn't think for themselves, oh, it's my fault. It's amazing that other people can kind of push that like, oh, you just weren't a good parent. You weren't diligent enough. You didn't talk to your kids about drugs. And that's not necessarily true. No, it's definitely not true. Um, that's 
blatantly still happening today. If there's an article in the paper, you always see, or on social media, you always see those people posting, oh, well, that's a parenting issue. They didn't do this or they didn't do that. Or, you know, you have to keep your kids busy and in sports. And we did all of that in my family, you know, football, baseball, basketball. Um, you know, nobody's perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect parent. And they're not born with a manual. And there's a lot of dangers out in the world that sometimes, you know, there's a doctor in Massachusetts, Dr. John Kelly, who describes it perfectly, that there's a reason you can't rent a car until you're 26. And that's because you're considered a risk because your brain is not developed until you're 26. So to think that an adolescent isn't going to make some very unwise decisions before that age or even after that age, but um, is not in reality. So, and you can't be with them 24 hours, seven days a week. You can't, you can't, you can't do that. And so at some point your son or daughter is going to be in a position to make a choice and they can make what you consider the right choice or they can make what you consider the wrong choice and you can't be there to guide them through every decision that they make and right. you know it none of us are going to lock up our kids in a closet we know that that's definitely not the not the way to go um so okay so you you were brought up and you you had this in your life what happened with your son so years and years later um in the early 2000s, OxyContin hit um, Purdue Pharma, the makers of OxyContin, marketed and unleashed it. Um, mismarketed, I should say, because they played mm. guilty for that. Yeah. Um, and OxyContin pills became very popular out in just everywhere. It was the new, it was the new fad for people to try. And I had never heard of it. And he had just graduated high school, and you know he tried it one night with a bunch of other people. And what he didn't realize is it was going to change his life for a very long time, if not forever. And it took us a while to figure out what it was. And when I mentioned the symptoms of schizophrenia, I started to think it was mental health. I, I thought, geez, maybe this is running in my family. Maybe this is what what's happening to him because he was up all night, sleeping all day. He wasn't... Um, as talkative as he used to be, or he was too talkative. It was just constant. It looked like mental health to me. I wasn't smelling things, you know? Um, so I took him to a crisis center and um, at one point, not still not knowing what he was doing. And um, they sent him out with lithium and uh, sleeping pills. And they said he had bipolar. So I was very relieved and I thought, well, now I know what it is. And you know, there's treatment for this and, you know, much different from back in the days with my sister. And it was not that. <laughs> um, by the time we figured out, I mean, giving him those drugs could have killed him because what it was, was he, by then he was already using heroin. And I, oh, wow. I don't know, um, which, you know, as most people know, if they're listening to the show that usually you graduate from you know, Oxycontin or snorting Percocets to heroin. Um, right, because heroin is cheaper. Right, and that's what had happened, and I didn't know, and here I was giving them lithium and sleeping pills along with heroin. Um, we eventually found out. It's a long story, but we did find out it was terrible. Uh, it really put a strain on our whole family, my husband and my other kids. Um, trying Joanne, to who introduced him to the Oxycontin? So there was a um, parent in town that had his own prescriptions that was sharing it with his own son and other kids in town. And that's another thing I learned over the years is, you know, he might have been a normal functioning person at one time in a, of his life, but then he became addicted to that and it changed him. And, and you know, they people end up doing things that they never dreamed they'd do. Um, I did find that out a long time later a long, long time later after my son went into recovery. But um, at the time, I didn't know what the first, it, it was very secretive, which is a symptom of, of this addiction, is secrets. 
and um, it took a long time to figure out where it started. But you know, it took him about four years to find find his first one full year in recovery. And now today, he's been in recovery for years and years. He's you know gone on with his life, married with children, does very very well. Um, I'm very very fortunate. Um, I'm very happy. I'm very happy that that's the case because so often. You know, I have interviewed mothers on this podcast whose um, children did not make it, and it just breaks my heart. I can't, it's even hard to talk about. Um, I'm curious, so you took him to a crisis center. Did they do any kind, it would it would make sense to me, maybe they would do blood testing or something to That's determine... It. Yeah, they didn't do any of that. They brought him in another room. He was 18, so I couldn't go in with him. Obviously, he didn't want me in there with him for obvious reasons. Um, and there was no there was no drug testing, anything. It was just they talked to him, and 15 minutes later, he came out, and he had bipolar. So, But again, that was, geez, about 16 years ago. It's changed a bit now. They're, you know, a lot more educated now on... The, the other drugs that are being used out there. So um, I don't think it's happening as much that way as it used to. But I would hope not, because yeah. even if you didn't suspect that um, someone was addicted to drugs, I would think that before you gave them drugs like lithium, maybe you'd want to do some kind of medical testing just to make sure. And that, um, yeah, okay. Yeah. That didn't happen. <laughs> wow. It did not happen, unfortunately. But um, anyway, I, you know, so the story goes, to make a very long story short, um, we went through this from like 2001 to about 2004 or 2003, about three years just trying to learn the continuum of care, how to find treatment, how to afford treatment that the first treatment wouldn't be the last treatment, all of that. And um, by 2003, he got into some trouble and, um, you know, got into the newspapers and the cat was kind of out of the bag. Um, And that's when the shame and stigma began again that I used to have when I was a kid. And it was like being kind of dragged back into, into that and, it just lit a fire in my belly and he, he got into big trouble and had to do a little bit of time. Um, so I was back visiting jails again and it was just like, you know, deja vu for me. Right. And once it started getting out there and the stigma started, I decided I was going to fight back and fight back for his dignity, my dignity, the family's dignity and say, Hey, there's a whole story behind this. It's not just what you're writing about. He, he and many, many other young people around here are addicted. And that was back in 2004. Yep. Um, no one, there was no Facebook. There was no social media. There was nothing. There was right. just like my mother, other than one meeting I could go to that was just going to tell me to take care of myself. So once I did that, I started hearing from people from all over the place. And um, it got into the newspaper that I was wanted to hear from other parents and I started talking about it kind of publicly and I connected with a district attorney who had like a, a large forum was trying to warn people about Oxycontin use and they were starting to see it a lot at overdose scenes and you know it was really starting to come out so back in those days I just kind of broke it open around here and and I heard from many, many people that had already lost kids or grandkids or they were raising grandkids or they were emailing me about their brother or sister. Or, and I became like this Dear Abby. So I decided to just get a room. And the first, you know, I called a local high school and asked if I could um, use a, a room there for a support group. And um, they said yes. And I set up a little Google like message board on the computers so that people could join. So I didn't have to just constantly answer emails. Like everyone could communicate there. And I started meetings and I started thinking, you know, let's get educated about this. Let's have people come and speak to us. Let's have doctors. Let's have people in recovery. Let's have 
people talk to us about treatment and what types of treatment there are, how do you afford it? And, you know, let's have people from the court systems come and talk to us, probation officers, police officers. So I sort of added a educational component to it rather than just sitting around talking about our war stories I wanted to learn. And I think that was part of our empowerment is to learn and get educated on it, which was something that my mother could have used a long time ago. In fact, my mother used to say, I wish that you had been around doing this for me when I was younger. So, you know, that's what we did. And today, um, it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And now today there's thousands of members. Um, we have on our website, like 12,000 members. It's not Facebook. It's very, um, very, con you know, we're very, careful about privacy and confidentiality. So we don't put our lives out on Facebook. So people join, everything's free, everything's anonymous. There's about 11 or 12,000 people on there. And then our meetings in Massachusetts, we have um, 24 meetings around the state. We're in like five different counties. And then we have a meeting in Florida, actually in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we're also for the state of Massachusetts, we train and give out nasal naloxone, which is Narcan, uh, which reverses an overdose. And we teach people how to recognize an overdose, what are the signs and symptoms and how to revive somebody and give them Narcan. So, you know, I quit my job in 2007 after doing this for like three years as, <laughs> you know, aside from my full job. And um, what was your full-time job? What were you doing? I worked for the National Fire Protection Association. I was okay. a secretary, so you know I, I didn't have any type of big role. Um, and Joanne, how did your son get clean and sober? How did what kind of treatment did he do? Um, so for him, it it's been abstinence. Okay. So um, he tried all the medications, other than I don't think he tried methadone, but um, that just didn't work for him. And it took many relapses for him. And then finally he was ready and, you know, he went to a private treatment um, twice. It took him twice, but then after that he was, you know, he goes, goes to his own meetings, things like that. So. And, and he's been sober since 2004? Um, no, actually it's more like, I think it's 2013. Wait a minute. It's been 11 years. I have to think about, I don't think about, I don't count years anymore. It's been 11 years. <laughs> okay. Understood. 2004 is when I started, um, learn to cope. Right. Right. So I was still going through that while I was doing learn to cope. You are listening to the addiction podcast point of no return for more information on the podcast or to reach out. If you have a story you would like to share with us, Go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narcan on Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I.org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. The service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. That's amazing that you could start this organization and offer support to others while you yourself were going through it. Yeah. That, that I didn't know that. I didn't know the timeline on that. And that's, 
that's quite something. I mean, kudos to you. Kudos to your son for getting clean and sober, no matter when that happened. You know, the point is that it did happen, but kudos to you to go through all of that and share with others when you're in the middle of it. I mean, yeah. Actually, it really, um, it helped me a lot because, you know, you talk about empowerment. It was something that I could do. I didn't feel so helpless. And I was also learning a lot and I was making a lot of connections. Um, and that, that just the education alone was part of my healing because that's when you stop blaming yourself because you learn that this isn't something that I did to him. Um, and I, and I'll say this for myself. I feel like it definitely is in the genes in my family. I told you my sister had the schizophrenia. She had a child, um, my niece Janine, who just passed away two years ago of an overdose. So that was very, very difficult. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you. So it still hits my family. Um, and you know, I found out years later, too, that the reason my mother's father never drank a drop of alcohol in his life is because he had found his dad deceased of an alcohol overdose. So, you know, to learn that, you know, maybe we have this gene in my family, and I'm just talking for myself, I truly believe that. And um, I think that that's what can happen is... You know, there's, you can send five kids in the woods and three will come out fine. The other two stay. So you just don't know who that's going to be. And Yep. I think it's a very good point. I've said this a couple of times on the podcast that, you know, while I think that ultimately it begins with a choice, you know, I had the choice to try LSD. I thought it sounded really insane and I never wanted to do it. I'm a child of the 60s. But... I think that drugs affect people differently. And I think that if you want to experiment with drugs, you need to understand you're playing Russian roulette. I know people who have done very, very hardcore drugs and just stopped. Mm -hmm. And then I know people who had to go through treatment, obviously. And then I, I know people who've died. And, you know, it's Russian roulette when you start messing around with drugs like Oxycontin or heroin or crack cocaine or whatever it is you're messing around with, it's Russian roulette. So if you want to do that, why don't you just go get a pistol and I'm sorry, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but go get a pistol, you know, put one bullet in there and just try it. That's what Russian roulette is because you don't know until you do it, how it's going to affect you. And if you walk away from like you're saying with the five going to the woods and the two don't come out, you know, you want to be the one that walks out the next morning and is addicted? I don't, I don't think so. That's not, I don't, it's not a good way to go. Well, like my son said, you know, when they tried it, they were like swinging off a tree swing and they thought, wow, this is great. We don't, you know, it, they felt so good. And he was like, it was like this feeling like he had never felt before. And they just wanted it more and more after that. And what they didn't realize is, you know, it was so potent when you snorted an 80 milligram Oxycontin back in those days, it went straight through your bloodstream, straight to your brain receptors. And you needed it after that. You just needed it. And they had no idea what was going to happen to them. It was just another day to them. They were just, they experimented with something and that was it. Yep. Yep. Um, what are you doing? Let's talk about your organization now. I'm, I have to tell you that I have mentioned your organization uh-huh. many, many times on the podcast because uh-huh. I just think that your organization is such a resource for Thank people you. who have someone in their lives who's going through addiction and they just don't know who to talk to. And while, you know, I'm not to debunk psychiatry or psychology. So often their solution is another drug. And I think that logically most of us know that it makes no sense to substitute one lethal substance for another lethal substance. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So I think that, you know, your organization, you offer such a service to people who are going through this. And I, like I say, I've mentioned it many, many times. I've emailed it to people because I think, you know, so often they just want someone to talk to 
who knows what they're going through Mm -hmm. and not somebody who has no clue. I'll be honest with you. My kids did not get into drugs. I wouldn't be the right person to talk to you about it. I don't, I've not, I have not experienced it, but I know you and the people who work with you have experienced it. And I think it's huge. I think that's, I think that's why um, there's something to be said about peer, peer support because um, you know, I, that's happened to me actually. I have an unbelievably awesome group of friends that I've been friends since we were teenagers but I couldn't talk to them about this. I needed somebody that knew exactly how I felt. And that's what we have today. So, you know, what we, what we always strive to do um, is make sure people feel better when they leave than they did when they came in and that they're armed with resources, hope, you know, information. Hope is huge. Support, education, all of that. And so that's what we, we do today. I mean, I, I'm very lucky that um, Learn to Cope was recognized around here as a solid resource. So the state, the Department of Public Health, Bureau of Addiction Services actually funds us now. So I have an unbelievable team. Everyone that works for Learn to Cope with an exception of like two people has been affected by this. So everybody understands what people are going through when when you make a call and you get someone from learn to cope you're going to get someone that knows that's been there that will talk to you and our meetings we offer a very very safe place um, where we don't judge we meet people where they're at even if somebody comes and and we don't feel like the form of treatment that their son or daughter is going with we don't judge that even we're just there for the family to help them cope with it to get through it and to learn from every scenario and um, you know, and just give out information and, and just be there for them. And we do have a lot of losses, unfortunately. Um, this year, this past six months has been pretty difficult with COVID, um, you know, around the whole world really. But I mean, you know, when somebody dies, you couldn't have that ritual, couldn't have a funeral, couldn't have your friends and family. So it was even harder for families with that. Um, we had people that lost parents to COVID and then lost their kids or a uh-huh. child. So it's been a really um, rough time for everybody. And But we put all of our meetings virtual. I saw that on your website. I think that's huge that you've... you've... Yeah you know, done that during the whole COVID thing, because people still need the yeah. meetings. They still need it. In fact, more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we got, so we have, uh, we took all of our meetings and kind of combined them by region. So I guess what I will say is the, sil- the silver lining of all of that is people are coming that never could get there before because they don't have to drive a long distance or they're in another state. And they can hop on this meeting and all of a sudden they've got all these new people to talk to. So we've got, you know, a lot of people coming from other states now, um, more so than we did before. And and also people in Massachusetts that weren't able to get to meetings before. Now they can go or if they've been a member for, say, they were a member of one meeting that they used to go to every Thursday night in Cambridge. Now on Monday nights, if they feel like it, if they can hop on to the Monday night meeting and go to Florida, Franklin, and Hudson. <laughs> so they're, it's, this, it's even um, enriched like the relationships and friendships that have formed. And that's, that's again, that's, that's healing. That's actually huge. I have a completely different program, completely just related to the podcast, and we would typically do live events where maybe we would have 60 people. But with the whole onset of COVID, we said, okay, let's do it virtually. Let's do it via Zoom. And now we can have people all over the world. You can have people all over the world. You don't have to necessarily open chapters in all the other states. I remember when we spoke before, you were starting to do that. But there's a lot of challenges involved with that because you have to basically clone yourself. What you've done is so successful. And oftentimes people take a little piece of it and alter it and then it doesn't quite work as well as what you do but this way you i hope you'll i hope you'll keep the whole virtual yeah. aspect in even yeah. after covid because yeah. you have the potential to reach so many more people 
over Zoom or Skype or whatever tool that you use. And yeah. I think that's huge. It's I'm I'm happy to know that because I again I always promote your organization because Thank you. Because so often people don't know who to turn to. They don't know what to do. And you you offer such a great resource for that. So that's huge. We will keep them online. Um, I don't know. I mean, when the time comes that they say we can get back to in-person, we'll probably still have in-person meetings, but we will definitely keep online meetings available. And we we started doing webinars, which are huge. Um, You know, we had one last week. And as soon as we put the registration, it's free and everything. But we still have people register so we know how many people will be there. And um, within like hours, there was over a hundred people registered and and it's, it's crazy, but I think people are so isolated and, you know, having a chance to listen to a speaker that's, you know, someone that's pretty renowned that you wouldn't normally be able to get to come to a meeting. It's really, really good. So I think you're right. And I think that while there's all this attention on the whole coronavirus And I've said this many times in the podcast, the addiction pandemic existed before the coronavirus. It's still going to be there after the coronavirus. And I think that there's so much media brouhaha about Corona and there's not as much attention on the addiction pandemic and it's still there. And I think that, um, I think, you know, I think it's huge that you offer a vehicle for people to talk about that, you know? Thank you. Yeah, we're doing what we can, but it's really, you know, luckily, I'm, what we, I don't know if, if we didn't have the internet, I don't know what would have happened. We wouldn't have been able to do this. So, you know, we're lucky to have the internet. Exactly. So. It has its pros and its cons. Yeah. <laughs> Joanne, what would you say, and this may be a tough question, but what would you say is like the most major thing that you've learned over the years from the people that have talked to you and talked to the others in your organization? Um, I guess what I would say is in the end of it all, all of it, we are not in control of what the outcome is going to be. All we can do is try our hardest to get educated, to find out ways that we can hopefully motivate somebody or help to motivate somebody to get to treatment, which doesn't always work. Um, But I think you have to take care of yourself within all of that. And that no matter what, as long as you take care of yourself and stay connected with people, really good friends and family that love you, you'll be okay because like I said, there's no one has control of what the outcome is going to be with this. When you start to face this, it's almost comparable to, you know, if somebody's loved one came down with a fatal disease that they had to fight um, because we know that this can be fatal if somebody doesn't find recovery but we can't guarantee that that person is going to seek and find it. So we have to make sure that we're going to be okay through that. And I guess that's what I've learned um, is that there's a lot of resilience out in the world that you can go through terrible things and still come out the other side. Um, I've had people, and this is kind of hard to even say, but I I've had people say that, and even in my own situation that, you know, even when you lose somebody, if you've been involved with something um, that you got the education and the support and you, you tried every Avenue. um, And then if you still lose that person, at least you, you felt like not, you never prepared, but at least you were somewhat prepared rather than someone that just finds out. And it's a shock that they didn't know that they were using or they didn't, or they tried to go through it alone and didn't know how to help them. If it's somebody that had that support and education and and um, were able to go through all the steps that a person, a family goes through before it happens, there's a little bit of a difference. Um, so I guess resilience and, and just, you know, like they say in like Alan on the three C's, you didn't cause it, you, you know, you didn't cause it, you can't cure it or control it. So... I think that's probably one of the most important things to really understand. 
Very, very good advice. And I think what resonates to me through everything you're saying is to get educated. And I don't mean by that to go off to all these different places on the internet and and do research, but rather talk to others who are going through it, who've gone through it, who know what it's like and get educated. Joanne, thank you so much for being willing to tell your story again on the podcast and update us on Learn to Cope. For our listening audience, I want to say that it's learn the number two yeah. cope dot org. Learn to cope dot org. Yeah. And you should definitely check it out if you are in the position where you you need you have questions and you need to get them answered. Right. If they want if they wanted to join a virtual meeting, all they have to do is go to our front page of our website and ask for a link and we'll send them one. Perfect. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> you too. Thanks. Thank you for being with us this week. I hope that you enjoyed the interview with Joanne Peterson, Executive Director of Learn to Cope. I think her organization is phenomenal because I think that so often when a parent or a child finds out that their loved one is addicted to drugs or alcohol, they don't know what to do. They don't know who to talk to. And you don't necessarily want to share that with your best friend or with, you know, your ladies that you have lunch with. So learn to cope. Learn the number two cope.org is where you go. And they have virtual meetings um, due to the whole COVID virus thing, which I think is huge because it is enabling them to go have a much broader reach than they could have with physical meetings. But um, anyway, check it out, learntocope.org. And we will be back again next week. Once again, this is my mantra. I will say it again. If you are addicted, please get help, get treatment today. Don't wait. If you are a loved one of an addicted parent or sibling or child, please get them into treatment sooner rather than later. We're heading towards the holidays and that is one of the most stressful times for all of us and even more so for addicts. And if you have the consideration, you don't want your loved one to be in a treatment facility during the holidays, it's a much better place for them to be because I can pretty much guarantee if you have them in your house, they're gonna be using. So get help, do it now, don't wait, and we'll talk to you again next week. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. For more information on Narconon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcononojai.org. Narconon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.